Um, here, just fixing a few things. Why this is being so difficult. There we go. Okay, I believe we are there. Hello, everybody. Look at all those nice people. What a pleasure to see you all, albeit virtually. And uh, me, I'm, I'm hanging in, I'm doing okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> still staying where I'm supposed to stay. We're all doing what we're supposed to do. Uh, we can't even go out and join protests or anything because we have, um, uh, particularly one family member who is very um, susceptible to, to any kind of uh, flu-like or virus of any kind uh, and would be particularly bad for them to get it. So we are, we are not out marching, although we, our hearts are with people who are um, trying to make positive changes in our system and uh, trying to make sure we have a more, a more equal and healthy system for everybody, not just for a small percentage. But that's a lot of work, and we're certainly not going to get it accomplished in the next few days or even weeks, but maybe each time we have one of these massive convulsions of society, some good usually comes out of it. So at the very least, even from my position as official old guy now, um, I can see that you know that that good will come out of it and uh, as i said we kind of wish we could be out there on the front lines ourselves but we are um sorry on this is the problem with looking at one's own beard and the and the thing it's you go oh my god it's sticking out all weird um that doesn't do any good for me though because i'm also looking at the thing coming out of the neck hole of my shirt and going oh that thing's sticking out looks really weird oh shoot it's my head um, anyway, so rambling, babbling, that's all right. It is a little bit after seven, and I am going to read, and I think tonight I'm going to try to see if I can't finish uh, and Ministers of Grace, but I don't think it's that long compared. I think it's even maybe a shorter bit than what we read last time, so it's hard to tell. Yeah, it is a little bit shorter, so I'm not in a huge hurry, um, but uh, so anything else of interest to tell y'all? Not that I can think of. We're just, uh, we're working. We're, we're taking very few trips outside of the house. And when we do, we're doing them, you know, all official and right, like uh, gloved and masked and all that. Um, we're doing a lot of things at home, but we always do anyway. And we're starting, trying to stay in touch with people that we love and let them know that we're okay and have them let us know that they're okay. 
And as I said, watching the news, being very involved in, in uh, at least again, vicariously, if not virtually, um, in what's going on. So that's pretty much the shape of things around here. Uh, the animals, as usual, are absolutely oblivious to anything except getting their stomachs scratched and getting regular feeding. So more power to them. And the young people uh, around the household are all doing a very good job of keeping themselves occupied in various ways, none of which so far have included arson or um, patricide, both things for which I am very pleased because uh, I'm firmly opposed to arson and patricide. And patricide by arson is one of my least favorites, so I'm very, very glad that they did. So um, tonight I think then we're going to finish up in Ministers of Grace. I'm in the midst for my late night reading, um, which I'm doing kind of to, to make a reading available for people in other time zones. Um, my late night reading, I'm actually reading Caliban's Hour, but I'm going to be on that for at the rate we're going for several more weeks. So I'll have to come up with something new for this time slot later on. Uh, it might be time to get out the old ukulele. Who knows? You know, just, <laughs> I may get desperate. I may throw sand on the floor and show you the my old soft shoe routine. Actually, I have no old soft shoe routine. I don't think I even have any soft shoes. So um, we will we will be in touch as to what various possibilities of things that I might read next time are. I haven't read any scary or upsetting or disturbing stuff yet, and that's always um, that's always fun. And um, I think you maybe deserve some some wretched scary stuff since I've been taking it easy on you for so long. Anyway, what I am reading to you from the moment, and yeah, God, there's a not that much left. Um, anyway, what I'm reading from you from, from at the moment. I can always throw another little short thing in tonight, I guess, if we run out of time. What else have I got in here that might be quick and short and amusing? God, we've done most of these things. Lord of mercy. Um, anyway, well, before we get into that, oh, okay, I know what I can do afterwards. Um, all right, so I'm going to read from And Ministers of Grace. This, of course, was originally published in an anthology. Not, of course, I, but I told you about it last week. It was originally published in an anthology called Warriors. That was edited by George R.R. R. Martin and the late and much lamented Gardner Desois, um, and whose loss was uh, just a huge blow to our community. And we were just miserable to lose him. But anyway... Um, this particular version is in The Best of Tad Williams, um, which is nice because it's a paperback, the edition I have, whereas the my copy of Warriors is, you know, a big old heavy thing. So at this rate, with my, my failing wrist joints, um, it's always a good idea to find the lightest possible version of the story to read. Uh, a quick update, um, or a quick reminder the story is about a man named Lamentation Cain. It takes place in the far future at a time when human colonization has moved out uh, far out into the galaxy. And in fact, there is a conflict going on between two of the leading powers of this, this human diaspora. Uh, one is the Archimedes system, which is founded by and deliberately uh, limited to rationalists. It is an anti-religious uh, system and a system of several different planets affiliated with each other. The other is um, the covenant system, and the covenant system is sort of the opposite. It is the other side of the chessboard. It is a... Co uh, not collaboration, it's a, and it's not coagulation, I'm losing it here. Um, it is a, a clump of uh, different religious uh, cultures that have made common cause. And so Lamentation Cain is from one of the more retrograde Christian parts of the, the uh, covenant system. And he is a, what he calls himself, a holy assassin. And so he has been sent to Archimedes, the home world of the, the Hellas system or whatever they're called, or, and um, to kill their prime minister and uh, as a direct blow against this opposition. 
And during the course of it, he has um, gotten there. He has learned largely how to ignore the little implant that he has in his head, which back on his, on his planet um, brought him what he calls spirit, which was the propaganda of his side. And here he's getting the much more libertarian propaganda of the, um, the coven of the uh, Archimedes system, which is basically not unlike turning your TV up full blast and, uh, or your, your, in your, uh, laptop and just listening to all the commercials that come on. Um, so anyway, that's where we are. He has managed to get to Archimedes. He has managed to get into the building where the prime minister, Kita Yanuari, has begun her, um, her speech. And he is coming down from the flies. Uh, he has managed to kill quite a few people along his way because he has all these special biological supplements that that he has been able to activate once he got onto Archimedes. So he is essentially a kind of superhero or supervillain, depending on where your where your sympathies lie. So I'm going to go back about a paragraph or two before I start reading, before I start the new stuff. This is Lamentation Cain we're talking about. He lands so hard that the stolen guard helmet pops off his head and bounces away. The first screams and shouts of surprise are beginning to rise from the crowd of parliamentarians, but Cain can hardly hear them. The shock of his 50-foot fall swirls through the enhanced cartilage of his knees and ankles and wrists, painful but manageable. His heart is beating so fast it almost buzzes, and he is so accelerated that the noise of the audience seems like the sound of something completely inhuman, the deep scrape of a glacier, the tectonic rumbling of a mountain's roots. Two more bullets snap into the floor beside him, chips of concrete and fragments of carpet spinning slowly in the air, hovering like ashes in a fiery updraft. The woman at the lectern turns toward him in molasses time, and it is indeed her, Kita Yanuari, the whore of Babylon. As he reaches toward her, he can see the individual muscles of her face react, eyebrows pulled up, forehead wrinkling, surprised, but not frightened. How can that be? He is already leaping toward her, curving the fingers of each hand into hardened claws for the killing strike. A fraction of a second to cross the space between them as bullets snap by from above and either side, the noise scything past a long instant later. Wow, wow, wow. Time hanging, disconnected from history. God's hand. He is God's hand, and this is what it must feel like to be in the presence of God himself, this shimmering, endless, bright now. And then the pain explodes through him and sets his nerves on fire, and everything goes suddenly and irrevocably black. And that's where we stopped last time. Lamentation came, wakes in a white room, the light from everywhere and nowhere. He is being watched, of course. Soon, the torture will begin. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Those were the holy words Spirit whispered to him when he lay badly wounded in the hospital after capturing the last of the holy warrior infiltrators another augmented soldier like himself, a bigger, stronger man who almost killed him before Cain managed to put a stiffened finger through his eyeball into his brain. Spirit recited the words to him again and again during his recuperations. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory, when his glory to his horror, he cannot remember the rest of the passage from Peter. He cannot help thinking of the martyred young woman who gave her life so that he could fail so utterly. He will see her soon. Will he be able to meet her eye? Is there shame in heaven? I will be strong, Cain promises her shade, no matter what they do to me. One of the cell's walls turns from white to transparent. 
The room beyond is full of people, most of them in military uniforms or white medical smocks. Only two wear civilian clothing, a pale man and her. Kita Yanuary. You may throw yourself against the glass if you want. Her voice seems to come out of the air on all sides. It is very, very thick and very, very strong. He only stares. He will not make himself a beast struggling to escape while they laugh. These people are the ones who think themselves related to animals. Animals. Cain knows that the Lord God has given his people dominion. Over all the beasts and fowls of the earth, he says out loud. So, says Prime Minister Yanwari, so this is the angel of death. That is not my name. We know your name, Cain. We have been watching you since you reached Archimedes. A lie, surely. They would never have let him get so close. She narrows her eyes. I would have expected an angel to look more angelic. I'm no angel, as you almost found out. Ah, if you're not, then you must be one of the ministers of grace. She sees the look on his face. How sad. I forgot that Shakespeare was banned by your mullahs. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. From Macbeth, it precedes a murder. We Christians do not have mullahs, he says as evenly as he can. He does not care about the rest of the nonsense, she speaks. Those are the people of the Crescent, our brothers of the book. She laughs. I thought you would be smarter than the rest of your sort, Cain, but you parrot the same nonsense. Do you know that only a few generations back your brothers, as you call them, set off a thermonuclear device trying to kill your grandparents and the rest of the Christian and Zionist brothers? In the early days before the covenant, there was confusion. Everyone knew the story. Did, you think, did she think to shame him with old history? Ancient quotations, banned playwrights from the wicked old days of earth? If so, then both of them had underestimated each other as adversaries. Of course, at the moment, she did hold a somewhat better position. So then, not an angel, but a minister. But you don't pray to be protected from death, but to be able to cause it. I do the Lord's will. Bullshit, to use a venerable old term. You are a murderer many times over Cain. You tried to murder me. But Januari does not look at him as though at an enemy. Nor is there kindness in her gaze, either. She looks at him as though he is a poisonous insect in a jar. An object to be careful with, yes, but mostly a thing to be studied. What shall we do with you? Kill me. If you have any of the humanity you claim, you will release me and send me to heaven. But I know you will torture me. She raises an eyebrow. Why would we do that? For information, our nations are at war, even though the politicians have not yet admitted it to their peoples. You know it, woman. I know it. Everyone in this room knows it. Kitty Januari smiles. You will get no argument from me or anyone here about the state of affairs between Archimedes and the Covenant system. But why would we torture you for information we already have? We are not barbarians. We are not primitives like some others. We do not force our citizens to worship savage old myths. You force them to be silent. You punish those who would worship the God of their fathers. You have persecuted the people of the book wherever you have found them. We have kept our planet free from the mania of religious warfare and extremism. We have never interfered in the choices of covenant. You have tried to keep us from gaining converts. The Prime Minister shakes her head. Gaining converts? Trying to hijack entire cultures, you mean? Stealing the right of colonies to be free of Earth's old tribal ghosts? We are the same people that let your predecessors worship the way they wished to. We fought to protect their freedom and were repaid when they tried to force their beliefs on us at gunpoint. 
Her laugh is harsh. Christian tolerance. Two words that do not belong together no matter how often they've been coupled. And we all know what your Islamists and Zionist brothers are like. Even if you destroy all the Archimedean Alliance and every single one of us unbelievers, you'll only find yourself fighting your allies instead. The madness won't stop until the last living psychopath winds up all alone on a hill of ashes, shouting praise to his god. Cain feels his anger rising and closes his mouth. He suffuses his blood with calming chemicals. It confuses him, arguing with her. She is a woman and she should give comfort, but she is speaking only lies, cruel, dangerous lies. This is what happens when the natural order of things is upset. You are a devil. I will speak to you no more. Do whatever it is you're going to do. Here's another bit of Shakespeare, she says. If your masters hadn't banned him, you could have quoted it at me. But man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, that's nicely put, isn't it? His glassy essence, like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as to make the angels weep. She puts her hands together in a gesture disturbingly reminiscent of prayer. He cannot turn away from her gaze. So what are we going to do with you? We could execute you quietly, of course. A polite fiction? died from injuries sustained in the arrest, and no one would make too much fuss. The man behind her clears his throat. Madam Prime Minister, I, I respectfully suggest we take this conversation elsewhere. Uh, the doctors are waiting to see the prisoner. Shut up, Healy. She turns to look at Kane again. Really look, her blue eyes sharp as scalpels. She is older than the martyrdom sister by a good 20 years, and despite the dark tint, her skin is much paler, but somehow, for a dizzying second, they are the same. Why do you allow me to become confused, Lord, between the murderer and the martyr? Cain, comma, lamentation, she says. Quite a name. Is that your enemies lamenting? Or is it you? crying out helplessly before the power of your God. She holds up her hand. Don't bother to answer. In parts of the covenant system, you are a hero, you know, a sort of superhero. Were you aware of that? Or have you been traveling too much? He does his best to ignore her. He knows he will be lied to, manipulated, that the psychological torments will be more subtle and more important than the physical torture. The only thing he does not understand is, why her? Why the Prime Minister herself? Surely he isn't so important. The fact that she stands in front of him at this moment instead of in front of God is, after all, a demonstration that he is a failure. As if in answer to this thought, a voice murmurs in the back of his skull. Arjuna's angel of death captured an attempt on PM Yanuari. Another inquires, have you smelled yourself lately? Even members of parliament can lose freshness. Just ask one. Even here in the heart of the beast, the voices in his head will not be silenced. We need to study you, the prime minister says at last. We haven't caught a guardian class agent before, not one of the new ones like you. We didn't know if we could do it. The scrambler field was only recently developed. She smiles again, a quick icy flash like a first glimpse of snow in high mountains. It wouldn't have meant anything if you'd succeeded, you know. There are at least a dozen more in my party who can take my place and keep this system safe against you and your masters. But I made good bait, and you leaped into the trap. Now we're going to find out what makes you such a nasty little instrument, little death angel. He hopes that now the charade is over, they will at least shut off the seed in his head. Instead, they leave it in place, but disable his controls so that he can't affect it at all. Children's voices sing to him about the value of starting each day 
with a healthy breakfast, and he grinds his teeth. The mad chorus yammers and sings to him nonstop. The pagan seed shows him pictures he does not want to see, gives him information about which he does not care, and always, always it denies that Cain's God exists. The Archimedeans claim they have no death penalty. Is this what they do instead? Drive their prisoners to suicide? If so, he will not do their work for them. He has internal resources they cannot disable without killing him. And he was prepared to survive torture of a more obvious sort. Why not this? He dilutes the waves of despair that wash through him at night when the lights go out. And he is alone with the idiot babble of their idiot planet. No, Cain will not do their job for them. He will not murder himself. But it gives him an idea. If he had done it in his cell, they might have been more suspicious. But when his heart stops in the course of a rather invasive procedure to learn how the note biotech has grown into his nervous system, they are caught by surprise. It must be a fail-safe, one of the doctors cries. Cain hears him as though from a great distance. Already his higher systems are shutting down. Some kind of auto-destruct. Maybe it's just cardiac arrest says another, but it's only a whisper, and Cain is falling down a long tunnel. He almost thinks he can hear spirit calling after him. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. His heart starts pumping again, twenty minutes later. The doctors, unaware of the sophistication of his autonomic control, are trying to shock his system back to life. Cain hoped he would be down longer and that they would have given him up for dead, but that was overly optimistic. Instead, he has to roll off the table, naked but for trailing wires and tubes, and kill the startled guards before they can draw their weapons. He must also break the neck of one of the doctors who has been trying to save him, but now makes the mistake of attacking him. Even after he leaves the rest of the terrified medical staff cowering on the emergency room floor and escapes the surgical wing, he is still in prison. Tired of the same old atmosphere, Holyoke Harbor, the little village under the bubble. We make our own air and it's guaranteed fresh. His internal modifications are healing the surgical damage as quickly as possible, but he is staggering starved of nutrients and burning energy at brush fire speed. God has given him this chance and he must not fail, but if he does not replenish his reserves, he will fail. Cain drops down from an overhead air duct into a hallway and kills a two-man patrol team. He tears the uniform off one of them and then, with stiffened, claw-like fingers, pulls gobbets of meat off the man's bones and swallows them. The blood is salty and hot. His stomach convulses at what he is doing, the old, terrible sin, but he forces himself to chew and swallow. He has no choice. Addiction a problem? Not with a neo-blood transfusion. We also feature the finest life-tested and artificial organs. He can tell by the sputtering messages on the guard's communicators that the security personnel are spreading out from the main guard room. They seem to have an idea of where he has been and where he now is. When he has finished his terrible meal, he leaves the residue on the floor of the closet and then makes his way toward the central security office, leaving red footprints behind him. He looks, he feels, sure, like a demon from the deepest floors of hell. The guards make the mistake of coming out of their hardened room thinking numbers and weaponry are on their side. Cain takes several bullet wounds, but they have nothing as terrible as the scrambling device which captured him in the first place, and he moves through his enemies like a whirlwind, snapping out blows of such strength that one guard's head is knocked from his shoulders and tumbles down the hall. Once he has waded through the bodies into the main communication room, 
He throws open as many of the prison cells as he can and turns on the escape and fire alarms, which howl like the damned. He waits until the chaos is ripe, then pulls on a guard's uniform and heads for the exercise yard. He hurries through the shrieking, bloody confusion of the yard, then climbs over the three sets of razor wire fencing. Several bullets smack into his hardened flesh, burning like hot rivets. A beam weapon scythes across the last fence with a hiss and a pop of snapping wire, but Kane has already dropped to the ground outside. He can run about 50 miles an hour under most circumstances, but fueled with adrenaline, he can go almost half again that fast for short bursts. The only problem is that he is traveling over open, wild ground and has to watch for obstacles. Even he can badly injure an ankle at this speed because he cannot armor his joints too much without losing flexibility. Also, he is so exhausted and empty even after consuming the guard's flesh that black spots caper in front of his eyes. He will not be able to keep up this pace very long. Here are some wise words from an ancient statesman to consider. You can do what you have to do, and sometimes you can do it even better than you think you can. Kids, all parents make mistakes. How about yours? Report religious paraphernalia or overly superstitious behavior on your local Freedom Council tip note. Your body temperature is far above normal. Your stress levels are far above normal. We recommend you see a physician immediately. Yes, Kane thinks. I believe I'll do just that. He finds an empty house within five miles of the prison and breaks in. He eats everything he can find, including several pounds of frozen meat, which helps him compensate for a little of the heat he is generating. He then rummages through the upstairs bedrooms until he finds some new clothes to wear, scrubs off the blood that marks him out, and leaves. He finds another place some miles away to hide for the night. The residents are home. He even hears them listening to news of his escape, although it is a grossly inaccurate version that concentrates breathlessly on his cannibalism and his terrifying nickname. He lays curled in a box in their attic, like a mummy, nearly comatose. When they leave in the morning, so does Cain, reshaping the bones of his face and withdrawing color from his hair. The pagan seed still chirps in his head. Every few minutes it reminds him to keep an eye open for himself, but not to approach himself, because he is undoubtedly very, very dangerous. Didn't know anything about it. Sartorius looks worriedly up and down the road to make sure they are alone, as if Cain hadn't already done that better, faster, and more carefully, long before the two locals had arrived at the rendezvous. What can I say? We didn't have any idea they had that scrambler thing. Of course we would have let you know if we'd heard. I need a doctor. Somebody you'd trust with your life, because I'll be trusting him with mine. Cannibal Christian, says young Carl in an odd voice. That's what they're calling you now. That's crap. He is not ashamed because he was doing God's will, but he does not want to be reminded either. Or the angel of death. They still like that one too. Either way, they're sure talking about you. The doctor is a woman too, a decade or so past her childbearing years. They wake her up in her small cottage on the edge of a blighted park that looks like it was manufacturing space before a halfway attempt to redeem it. She has alcohol on her breath and her hands shake, but her eyes, although a little bloodshot, are intelligent and alert. Don't bore me with your story and I won't bore you with mine, she says when Carl begins to introduce them. A moment later, her pupils dilate. Hang on, I already know yours. You're the angel everybody's talking about. Some people call him the cannibal Christian, says young Carl helpfully. Are you a believer? Cain asks her. I'm too flawed to be anything else. Who else but Jesus would keep forgiving me? She lays him out on a bed sheet on her kitchen table. He waves away both the anesthetic inhaler and the bottle of liquor. They won't work on me unless I let them, and I can't afford to let them work. I have to stay alert. 
Now please cut that godless thing out of my head. Do you have a spirit you can put in? Beg pardon? She straightens up, the scalpel already bloody from the incision he is doing his best to ignore. What do you call it here? My kind of seed, a seed of covenant, so I can hear the voice of spirit again. As if to protest its own pending removal, the Archimedes seed abruptly fills his skull with a crackle of interference. A bad sign, Cain thinks. He must be overworking his internal systems. When he finishes here, he'll need several days rest before he decides what to do next. Sorry, he tells the doctor. I didn't hear you. What did you say? She shrugs. I said I'd see, I'd have to see what I have. One of your people died on this very table a few years ago. I'm sad to say, despite everything I did to save him, I think I kept his communication seed. She waves her hand a little, as though such things happen or fail to happen every day. Who knows? I'll have a look. He cannot let himself hope too much. Even if she has it, what are the odds that it will work? And even more unlikely, that it will work here on Archimedes. There are booster stations on all the other colony worlds, like Arjuna, where the word is allowed to compete freely with the lies of the godless. The latest crackle in his head resolves into a calm, sweetly reasonable voice. No less a philosopher than Aristotle himself said, men create gods after their own image, not only with regard to their form, but with regard to their mode of life. Cain forces himself to open his eyes. The room is blurry, the doctor a faint shadowy shape bending over him. Something sharp probes in his neck. There it is, she says. It's going to hurt a bit coming out. What's your name? Your real name? Lamentation. Ah. She doesn't smile. At least he doesn't think she does. It's hard for him to make out her features. But she sounds amused. She weepeth sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers she hath none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. That's Jerusalem they're talking about, the doctor adds. The original one. Book of Lamentations, he says quietly. The pain is so fierce that it's all he can do not to reach up and grab the hand that holds the probing, insupportable instrument. At times like this, when he most needs to restrain himself, he can most clearly feel his strength. If he were to lose control and loose that unfettered power, he feels that he could blaze like one of the stellar torches in heaven's great vault, that he could destroy an entire world. Hey, says a voice in the darkness beyond the kitchen, the pool of light on the kitchen table. Young Carl. Hey, something's going on. What are you talking about? demands Sartorius. A moment later, the window explodes in a shower of sparkling glass, and the room fills with smoke. Not smoke, gas. Kane springs off the table, accidentally knocking the doctor back against the wall. He gulps in enough breath to last him a quarter of an hour and flares the tissue of his pharynx to seal his air passages. If it's a nerve gas, there is nothing much he can do, though. Too much skin exposed. In the corner, the doctor struggles to her feet, emerging from the billows on the floor with her mouth wide and working, but nothing coming out. It isn't just her. Carl and Sartorius are holding their breath as they shove furniture against the door as a makeshift barricade. The bigger older man already has a gun in his hand. Why is it so quiet outside? What are they doing out there? The answer comes with a stuttering roar. Small arms fire suddenly fills the kitchen wall with holes. The doctor throws up her hands and begins a terrible jig as though she is being stitched by an invisible sewing machine. When she falls to the ground, it is in pieces. Young Carl stretches motionless on the floor in a pool of his own spreading blood and brains. Sartorius is still standing unsteadily, but red bubbles through his clothing in several places. Cain is on the ground. He has dropped without realizing it. He does not stop to consider near certainty of failure, but instead springs to the ceiling and digs his fingers in long enough to smash his way through with the other hand, then hunkers in the crawl space until the first team of troopers 
come in to check the damage. Flashlights darting through the fog of gas fumes. How did they find him so quickly? More importantly, what have they brought to use against him? Speed is his best weapon. He climbs out through the vent. He has to widen it, and the splintering brings a fusillade from below. When he reaches the roof, dozens of shots crack past him, and two actually hit him, one in the arm and one in the back. These from the park security vehicles, where the rest of the invasion team are waiting for the first wave to signal them inside. The shock waves travel through him so that he shakes like a wet dog. A moment later, as he suspected, they deploy the scrambler. This time, though, he is ready. He saturates his neurons with calcium to deaden the electromagnetic surge. And although his own brain activity ceases for a moment and he drops bonelessly across the roof crest, there is no greater damage. A few seconds later, he is up again. Their best weapon spent, the soldiers have three seconds to shoot at a dark figure scrambling with incredible speed along the roof line. And Lamentation Kane jumps down into the hot tracery of their fire, sprints forward and leaps off the hood of their own vehicle and over them before they can change firing positions. He can't make it to full speed this time, not enough rest and not enough refueling. But he can go fast enough that he has vanished into the hellish city sewers by the time the strike team can remobilize. The Archimedes seed, which has been telling his enemies exactly where he is, lies behind him now, wrapped in bloody gauze somewhere in the ruins of the doctor's kitchen. Kita Januari and her rationalists will learn much about the ability of the Covenant scientists to manufacture imitations of Archimedes' technology, but they will not learn anything more about Cain. Not from the sea. He is free of it now. He emerges almost a full day later from a pumping station on the outskirts of one of Hellas City's suburbs. But now he is a different cane entirely. A cane never before seen. Although the doctor removed the Archimedes seed, she had no time to locate, let alone implant, a spirit device in its place. For the first time in as long as he can remember, his thoughts are entirely his own, his head empty of any other voices. The solitude is terrifying. He makes his way up into the hills west of the great city, hiding in the daytime, moving cautiously by night because so many of the rural residents have elaborate security systems or animals who can smell cane even before he can smell them. At last, he finds an untended property. He could break in easily, but instead extrudes one of his fingernails and hardens it to pick the lock. He wants to minimize his presence whenever possible. He needs time to think, to plan. The ceiling has been lifted off his world and he is confused. For safety's sake, he spends the first two days exploring his new hiding place only at night with the lights out and his pupils dilated so far that even the sudden appearance of a white piece of paper in front of him is painful. From what he can tell, the small, modern house belongs to a man traveling for a month on the eastern side of the continent. The owner has been gone only a week, which gives Cain ample time to rest and think about what he is going to do next. The first thing he has to get used to is the silence in his head. All his life, since he was a tiny, unknowing child, spirit has spoken to him. Now he cannot hear her calm, inspiring voice. The godless prattle of Archimedes is silenced, too. There is nothing and no one to share Cain's thoughts. He cried that first night. He cries that first night, as he cried in the horror's room like a lost child. He is a ghost. He is no longer human. He has lost his inner guide. He has botched his mission. He has failed his God and his people. He has eaten the flesh of his own kind and for nothing. Lamentation came as alone with his great sin. He moves on before the owner of the house returns. 
He knows he could kill the man and stay for many more months, but it seems time to do things differently, although Cain can't say precisely why. He can't even say for certain what things he is going to do. He still owes God the death of Prime Minister Januari, but something seems to have changed inside him, and he is in no hurry to fulfill that promise. The silence in his head, at first so frightening, has begun to seem something more. Holy, perhaps, but certainly different than anything he has experienced before, as though every moment is a waking dream. No, it is more like waking up from a dream. But what kind of dream has he escaped? A good one or a bad one? And what will replace it? Even without spirits prompting, he remembers Christ's words. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. In his new inner silence, the ancient promise seems to have many meanings. Does Cain really want the truth? Could he stand to be truly free? Before he leaves the house, he takes the owner's second best camping equipment, the things the man left behind. Cain will live in the wild areas, in the highest part of the hills, for as long as seems right. He will think. It is possible that he will leave Lamentation Cain there behind him when he comes out again. He may leave the angel of death behind as well. What will remain? And who will such a new sort of creature serve? The angels? Devils? or just itself. Cain will be interested to find out. And that's the end of that story. So we have a little bit over 10 minutes to go. I think I'm going to read you a short little bit, actually, that the introduction to this book. But first I'm going to stretch. Stretch! And I'm wearing the Who shirt, wearing the Who shirt for those who are keeping track. My children gave it to me, and indeed it's a great favorite. I was reading it last night too. I did take it off to sleep, and then I put it back on because why the heck not? It's a good shirt. Um, anyway, so all right, so I'm going to read one more short thing, and then we're going to start the wind up for tonight. Um, I thought this was appropriate because it actually is something that people often ask me. It's just a couple pages, but I thought I'd. I thought I'd share it with y'all just in case. Again, this is a, a this is just a bit of serendipity because I happen to be reading this book and the the best of Tad blah blah blah, and uh, I wrote an introduction for this book, and it is indeed a question, um, so I thought I would read that to you. So are you ready? Are you hunched in your chairs? Did you go get your beverages or whatever? And uh, you ready to listen some more? Just for a couple pages. Where do stories come from? That's a question I hear a lot. Here's the truth, at least as far as I know it. They don't come from anywhere. They're already there, and they just need to be recognized. Stories are all around, infinite in their numbers. They're in every word, every experience, every object. Let's take a rock, for instance. Just a nice, smooth stone about the size of your closed fist. Not a gemstone, nothing so easy. Just an ordinary stone. What's the story there? Well, Cain picked up a stone like that and killed his brother Abel. That's a pretty famous story right there, if a trifle on the brutal side. And David killed the giant Goliath with a stone too. But we don't even need to deal with the homicidal aspect of stones to find stories. What if you were the size of an ant? That simple stone is now something quite large. It might be blocking your path in the middle of an important journey. It might be an object of worship. It might have rolled down a hill and killed your entire family. Oh, oops, I said I wasn't going to do murderous stones. As an ordinary sized stone, it might be the key to a mystery. Perhaps it has a bit of important DNA on it or a few scratchings from a forgotten race of humanity. 
but it's lost among thousands of nearly identical stones. How do you find it? Will it be found in time? A rock can be a paperweight on the desk of an old, cruel man. Why does he keep it? What can it mean to him? A rock might be the toy of a child who can't afford any better ones. It might be used to keep a door from slamming shut so someone doesn't get locked out of her house until the day the rock rolls a few inches too far and the door slams and she can't get back in. There's a story there, I can tell. And if there's a story in every rock, lots of stories, as I've just shown, how many more stories are waiting out there, disguised as pigeons or a flyer somebody dropped on the sidewalk, or masquerading as your mail carrier, or a strange wisp of cloud in an otherwise blue sky? How many stories are riding on the train next to you, reading their newspapers and wondering why you're inspecting them so strangely? How about the stories lying piled in your garage, posing as old clothes, waiting to go to the Goodwill? Or the story pretending to be the neighbor's noisy dog? Did you step over a story in the gutter today because it looked like nothing more than a broken bottle, the label worn away by water and weather? Who dropped it there? What did that person do next? That's the world I live in. If I suppress the expectedness, the ordinariness of things, and allow myself to look around a bit more carefully, I start seeing and hearing stories everywhere around me. Nearly every story in this book started that way, as a little something that caught my attention. Perhaps a dream that clung for a moment after I woke up, or an unexplained aside in a history book. Maybe something as simple as a few words in the conversation of passing strangers stripped of context and thus wonderfully inexplicable. Like I said, stories don't just show up. They're not traveling salesmen rapping at your door with a suitcase full of romance and mystery and science fiction. No, stories are already there, but you need to look for them. Maybe the story you want isn't in the salesman's briefcase with all that other obvious stuff, but rather in the scuffed shoes he's wearing or the slightly desperate smile on his face that suggests he hasn't made a sale yet today. Or maybe it's in the lies he tells on the phone when he calls home to say he'll be late. Maybe it isn't anything to do with the salesman, but instead comes from the elderly man across the street who looks out his window and realizes that after living in the neighborhood for 40 years, he doesn't know any of the neighbors the salesman is visiting. Anything can be a story. Because a story can be anything, any idea. Then the work starts. You have to pick up whatever set you thinking and really look at it. Examine it from all angles. Think about where it's been and what's happened to it and what might not have happened but could. You have to think about what would make someone else want to know the story. And then you have to take that rock that conversation, that cloud, that salesman, whatever has caught your imagination, and work with it. You must shape it and expose its inner elements. Bring them to light so that everyone else will see what you saw, hear what you heard, feel what you felt when you noticed that story. Stories are all around. You don't have to look very far. They're in the room where you're reading this, in your life, in your memories, and there are lots more just outside your door. And then this, the rest of this is the, because it's an introduction. These are just a few that I found. You're welcome to share what I made of them and I hope you enjoy them. But I left plenty of stories out there if you'd like to find some for yourself. Their resource will never exhaust one of the few. And the most important thing you have to, under, have to understand is this, until they're found and shared, they're wasted. So even if you don't want to make any of your own, I'd love to have you take a look at mine. And that was Santa Cruz, California, October 24th, 2013, which at the moment, at the time, seemed very current and very present, but is already now beginning to sound like, oh yeah, way back then.
back when the Giants were winning World Series <laughs> or things like that, the kind of things sports fans think about. Anyway, so we are coming up close to the top of the hour and um, anything else I wanted to talk about? Um, not really. I mean, you guys can always feel free to send me questions ahead of time. It's almost impossible um, for me to look at the things that are coming in. Um, I have since I started, I have realized. Um, it's almost impossible for me to look at things coming in and move them around and, you know, do all that stuff to get questions. But if you guys want to send me questions ahead of time, either through Facebook or those of you who have my email address or whatever the case may be, or on Twitter, um, you know, because either Deb or I are on all those things pretty much every day. I'd be very happy to. I'd be happy to talk more about writing if people would like. Um, even do some, you know, I, 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 I'm slightly leery of this, this whole master class thing that's going on because I, I, especially with writing, I'm not sure how much um, specific instruction with writing is really useful because everybody's methodology is so different. But there are certain things, certain ways of thinking, certain ways of approaching writing problems that can be useful to other people. Uh, whereas kind of things that are not all that useful, I don't think, are things like, well, what word processing program do you use? Or what time of the day do you write? Because those are all things that every writer is going to find out what works for herself or himself, you know, or themselves. And they're going to, you know, make up their own process. And until you discover your process, there's no point in anybody else or the most they can give you is another suggestion for something to try. But there is a lot in terms of the process of thinking that we could talk about. And I'm always happy to share that because I'm one of the more conscious writers, I think, in the sense that I analyze my own uh, process quite a bit. I think about things. I do things on purpose. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is a, a way that I operate. And therefore, I'm sometimes more able to explain why I've done things than some other writers for whom their subconscious is, is where it all comes from. And it's largely a mystery. Um, I'm more of a grinder. I'm more of an architect rather than a pantser, um, as the, the that old definition between two kinds of writers. Seat of, the, seat of the pantsers and architects. I'm more the architect type, although I can do the pantsing thing too when necessary. And often doing short stories, actually. They often start as just basic ideas. Anyway, enough bibble babble. Um, with that, um, I am going to say I will be back next week um, for both times, both the two o'clock in the morning Pacific Daylight Time and the one we're doing now, which is the 7 p.m. Sunday Pacific Daylight Time. And when I do, we will be starting something new. I don't know yet what it might be. Uh, if you guys want a kind of scary, creepy story, I could do one of those. I think I still have a few less creepy things I could read, or I could start another longish short novel, like Child of an Ancient City, or, you know, do things like that. Um, after seeing how long Caliban is going to take and the toll on my voice from it, I'm not sure I want to start one of my actual long novels, because I could be committing to like a year's worth of reading with that, and not quite sure I'm ready for that. But I definitely will keep reading, especially as long as we're in pandemic, and who knows, maybe we'll hang on to this slot afterward as well, and make it a little public meeting place. It's up to you guys. I'm, I'm remarkably easy. I'm, I'm cheap. I can be had for really honest, for, for happy meal toys. You know, you can buy me for almost nothing. Okay. With that thought in mind, I want to thank all of you for joining me so very much and remind you again, please take good care of yourselves and your loved ones. If you're protesting, be safe. Um, don't let anybody provoke you into doing something that you wouldn't do. Um, and, but on the other hand, don't let anybody hurt you either. And don't let anybody make, um, make, take away your message of what you're trying to get across. If you are simply like those of us here trying to get through the pandemic, keep on keeping on, be good to each other, be good to your loved ones and friends, look out for your neighbors. And I think that's basically it. So thank you so much for becoming a regular part of my life here at uh, Casa de Confusion, and take good care of yourselves. Okay, with much love from our house to your house, on behalf of Deborah, myself, our multitude of young people 
and uh, are a really, really grisly crew of animals. I wish you all good night, and I'll.